everybody. It is episode 80. 80. Okay. <laughs> Email Soderback. Email Soderback. I'm Modem Lynch. <laughs> and we're here today to talk to you about the internet. Don't you love it when we tell you a little bit about how the sausage gets made here at Viva Physical Media? It gets made by AI robots. <laughs> and beeps and bloops, zeros and ones. Boy. We're not here to talk to you about the internet, but no. we are here to, let's see, we got some updates. We did the parking lot sale. It was a it was Huge. a crazy success. Big success. It was the best parking lot sale that we have ever done. Correct. We sold literally like 80 billion laser discs and like a thousand hundred million VHS tapes. And I was even on the news. That's true. You were on the news. I will work here in some capacity until we are dust. I was so hungry. Did you get to do the weather? No, but I was probably like visibly sweating because I was <laughs> extremely hungover and all of a sudden I was on the news. But I think I did a really good job. You guys let me know how I good I did. I think you did a good job. Parking lot sale was, it was amazing. It was super fun. We had music out there. Everyone bought a bunch of cool shit. Mm -hmm. I, some people were like literally wheeling away carts of stuff, which was rad. So one guy gave me stuff that he wanted to donate and I was like, well, that's not. Not, not today. That's not, not how this that's works. really not how it works, but all right, sir. Yeah, what else? What else? We had the new? vinegar syndrome pop up yesterday. Oh man, were you? Did you? Were you there That's for why that? I wasn't here for that. It looked rad. Vinegar syndrome rules. Rich, were you here for that? I was. How was it? It seems fairly busy. Yes. Yes. Those well, guys rule. The big news is we're still raising a lot of money. Yeah, and we have still a lot to go. So this is uh, us asking you again for your support and your help, your continued commitment to our store. Tell everybody that you know about us. Everybody. Everybody. Post on social media. Tell um, your pets. Tell your pets' parents. Just start talking to them. You can donate at our link below, or you can become a member. You can come to the store. There's lots of ways you can support us, but the important thing is to not lose steam. We don't want people to, to like think that you know, this is a scary thing. We might go away and then just like forget because yeah. that is not. We're going to be raising this money until the end of the year. So yeah. keep it coming. Keep it Keep the coming. momentum going. Spread the word. Spread the word. Yes. Spread the word. Uh, what else? We got Zeitgeist coming up next week. Yeah. That's Robert Horton. He's doing a virtual discussion about ad movie adaptations that are like really divergent from the source. Material. Horton knows what he's talking about too. Horton, he does. He hears... When he hears a who, it's been heard. <laughs> yes, that's for sure. And then uh, Cat and the Canary on the 24th. Yeah. I don't know if this will be out before then or after then. I don't know. But we're doing that at the Beacon, the 24th Cat and Canary fundraiser for Scarecrow. Live score by Corey Brewer. It's going to be really fun. Yeah. I'm super excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. And yeah, that's how things are going for us so far. We, we got a real meat and potatoes episode for you tonight. But like, a, it's like a lean cuisine. Lean, not a Marie Callender. No, it's not. It's like opposite of Baconator. It's a very, it's like a diet <laughs> episode. It's like a Whopper Junior. Yeah. Or it's like even like, yeah, just like a cheeseburger. If you just order like cheeseburger. Just a cheeseburger. Uh, a we don't cheeseburger. have a lot of extras this episode, but that doesn't mean this episode's not going to fucking rule. But we don't have a mailbag, but if you'd like to email us, I just want to remind everyone it's viva at scarecrow.com. Yeah, you can send us whatever mail. you want. We are also still going to do the thing where if you donate $100 and you let us know, and you can give us a list of rapid wrecks. Rapid wrecks. And, we'll give you and rapid that's wrecks. still getting a $50 match for the first five takers. Yeah, so your $100 is actually $150 yeah. to Scarecrow video, and you get 10 custom movie recommendations. Well, you get 20. Because one from each of us. Correct. So that's that's almost too much for your buck, but we'll let you have it. You can't afford not to do it. Yeah, you're losing money, obviously. And I think that's all the, that's the updates, and we can just you slide just right into in. episode yeah. 80. Yep. Cool. My first movie is going to be Drowning by Numbers. By Peter Greenaway. And this is the first movie I've ever seen by Peter Greenaway. Really? Yeah. All yeah. right. It just, it was on my watch list and I just randomly chose it and it was amazing and I fucking love it. <laughs> so this is from 1988. It is a super dreamy kind of surreal and also, I can't speak to any of his other movies, but I think this tends to be kind of his style, like very theatrically set, kind of almost like a play and it's about three women. They're all named Sissy. Sissy, you're mad. 
and one of them is in her 60s, one of them is in her 30s, and one of them's 19. And what's really funny and coincidental is that the oldest lady is played by Joan Plowright, who plays Nanny in 101 Dalmatians that we watched for this episode. Correct. And then the youngest woman is the girl who plays Anita in 101 Dalmatians. Wow, yeah. And I watched this... This was, I watched before, I think we even decided to watch yeah. on One Dalmatian. So very coincidental. Anyways, there's these three women, they're best friends. They're, kind of, they're all kind of related. They're different generations. They're all named Sissy. And it all takes place in this coastal town in England. And the movie starts with the eldest woman who walks into her like barn out back and her drunk, fat, stupid slob husband is naked in like the bathtub with the, the town floozy. You're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be playing cows. <laughs> and she decides then and there to drown him. That's it, gave it to me. <laughs> so she just kind of like presses his head underwater and easily drowns him. And do she's we just have a like, town flu? We should have a town floozy. Yeah, I would love. To, I would love to meet a town floozy. A Jezebel. Yes. She tells her besties they go to the town corner, who's also one of their good friends. His name's Magit, and he's just like this like weird kind of. I'm sure he's a famous dude. I didn't look up who who plays him, but he has a crush on all three of them. Could you get it up three times in an afternoon, Richard? I'd like to try. And he's a town coroner, so they're kind of like, hey, can you just like say that this was an accident? What do I get for writing out a death certificate that says death caused by drowning after heart attack? Due to excessive drinking. Matchet, I'm appalled. I see. What do you want, Matchet? Well, Sissy, I'd have thought you'd have guessed. And he's like, yeah, but you guys have to like mm -hmm. go on dates with me or whatever. <laughs> Meanwhile, he has a son who is a super nerd. He's like 12 years old and he's obsessed with counting and creating games. The game, Flights of Fancy or Reverse Strip Jump, is played from as high a jumping point as a competitor will dare. And he is also obsessed with like dead things. So every time he finds like a dead animal or like a dead bug or like there's an accident or something like that or roadkill, he'll like put up a little placard that is a number and he counts the deaths throughout this entire movie. And it's very whimsical and weird. A violent death is always celebrated by a firework. The second sissy, the, medi the medium one, the, the one in the middle. The medium sissy. <laughs> the medium sissy ends up drowning her husband in the ocean and does the same thing, goes to the corners, like, can you please just say it was an accident? He's like, you guys, I really, like, I shouldn't get caught up in this, but I'm going to do it because I love all of you. And then the third woman does it with her boyfriend in the pool. How did you know? <laughs> drowning, like most things, I'm in threes. I don't do that. So it's this weird kind of almost folk tale, fairy tale type thing where they go and they drown their husbands and the whole town is kind of suspicious. It's one conspiracy against another. Yours against theirs. Yours to drown, theirs to prosecute. It's just like some weird, surreal kind of fairy tale. It's a gorgeous looking movie too. Like, Every single shot is just maximalist and detailed. There's so many themes of death and decay, but also flowers and fruit, but the fruit's rotting, and the bedrooms are very purposefully messy, and there's just details everywhere. And it was just, I mean, I, I was just blown away by it. I thought it was a really amazing, weird, morbidly funny kind of fairy tale. It's also very much like... Wes Anderson's gotta love this mm. movie. If mm. not Peter Greenaway, I'm excited to look at his other movies, but Cassidy this is- Cook the Thief. Yeah, that one I've, I've known about for a long time, but I've never, yeah. for some reason, never oh, watched shit. it. But this one was great. I definitely recommend it. It's a weird one, but it's also super funny and dark. So, drowning by numbers. Is this the guy who plays the coroner? Yeah. That's the captain of the Titanic. <gasps> Fat men have little penises. <laughs> I revisited an old, an oldie but a goodie that I hadn't seen in a while. Yeah. And it's hard to find. There is a, there is kind of a very low quality DVD, but I stuck with this tape. Uh, and it is Paul Schrader's working class music classic, Light of Day. Oh. 
Starring Michael J. Fox and Joan Jett. I think I have seen this. I think I rented the tape too. They are brother and sister and they live in Cleveland and they are in a rock band with Michael McKean called the Bar Busters. And they just want to make it. But it's a poor factory town, you know? They don't got a lot of resources. They don't got a lot of time left. Damn. Michael J. Fox is, like, his, his sister Joan Jett, she's, like, estranged from mom and dad. Hey, come on. Hey, look, I told her, I warned her, I was real clear. I told her if she mentioned church or rock and roll or marriage, I'd walk out of the room if I was in it, hang up the phone if I was on it. She can't bring up those subjects no more. It was just prayer. And Michael J. Fox is trying to keep the family together. He's also trying to keep his sister out of trouble. She's a single mom. We don't really know, or at least we find, we don't find out till later who, who the father is. She's never told anybody who the father of her child is. Won't even say who. She won't even tell me. I'm a mother, Jet. You know, I just saw Joan Jet when I saw Lannis Morissette. Really? Yeah. I saw Joan Jet walking down the street one time, and this was in the 90s when she had a shaved head, and all I could think about was how much I wanted her to beat me up. You probably could have made that happen, like, really easily. I probably could have, but, like, <laughs> it wouldn't have been in a sexy way. Yeah, it would have been authentic. Yeah. Anyway, digression. <laughs> like I said, they're in this rock band, and they decide they're going to go on tour, but, you know, that doesn't really work out for them either because it's the middle of winter, and, you know, it's hard to get paid out on, on the road. I don't pay more than 175 for a band without an album. That's what you quoted on the phone. The Frenchmen get 250 here. Frenchmen are hot poo around here. Well, so are we. You may be hot poo back in Cleveland, but around here, you just warm snap. Everybody's got their own struggles. You know, Joan Jett is like stealing equipment to, to make better music. She ends up splitting off and joining another band later on in the movie. It, it's less about the music. The music is kind of a backdrop. Originally, he, Paul Schrader wanted uh, Bruce Springsteen to be, like, yeah. to do the music and stuff and be in I the movie, but, but he didn't do it. He did write the song Light of Day, which is the theme song for the mm -hmm. movie. Also, Joni sings one of my favorite songs ever called This Means War in it. This means war. It's a really good, like, sort of working class drama. I think there needs to be more, like, class stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't, it, it doesn't really uh, make the world that they exist in bigger than just their small family bubble. The dad is Jason Miller from The Exorcist. You know, we got a good life, me and her. We don't talk much, we don't go out much, but I can't complain. And their mom is RIP as of yesterday, Jenna yeah. Rollins. R.I.P. Anybody on the street can tell if they're lying. Otherwise, uh, the police would be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> sort of the last third of the movie is when the, it really sort of kicks into high gear and you start to get a lot of empathy for all the characters. You get a much broader picture of their emotional states. Michael J. Fox is really, really good in this. He smokes in this movie. And I don't know if you know this, but Michael J. Fox was like a lifelong chain smoker. Mm. Uh, and, but he almost never allowed himself to be photographed smoking. But he oh. does smoke on camera in this movie. Everybody sort of gets their moment to articulate their, their sort of their grief and, and, and their anger with each other that's been simmering below the surface. It's an interesting drama. I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to call it great. However, there is this one incredible moment, speaking of things I want Joan Jett to do. <laughs> Late in the film, the family is sort of broken up, and Michael J. Fox goes to see Joan Jett. Uh, to try to get her to, like, spend some time with their dying mother. You know, she is going to die. And she rebuffs him. And he basically says, like, I've had it with you. And he walks out. They're in a video arcade. And there's this amazing shot of Joan Jett standing in front of a gyrus cabinet, looking over her shoulder wistfully as Michael J. Fox walks out on her. And I want a woman to look at me that way one day. <laughs> <laughs> how how shreddery is this? It is it has, not it has that the working shreddery. class stuff for sure. It's but not that shreddery. It's visually pretty this. pretty unremarkable, I would say. Yeah. And he said so himself. He's like, I was learning how to become a visual filmmaker, and this didn't. He, he's like disappointed with this movie. I'd imagine that one of the reasons it's harder to see is because of music rights music, issues I'm and sure. stuff. But it's, it's but if you can find it, seek it out. It's worth checking out, and you know you can probably find it non licitly But if you have access to the tape or the DVD, I would definitely recommend that you watch that. This is a really interesting film, and not a lot of people have seen it. Schrader's having like 
a resurgence now. People love him again after, you know, First Reformed and the card counter and Master Gardener. People his, really like that stuff. His Facebook statuses. His Facebook stuff, his Taylor Swift fandom. <laughs> he, he's blown up again. You know, I think it's totally... And, and you know, even his older stuff. People people still like Mishima. You know, they like Patty Hearst. My favorite I've talked about on the show before is Light Sleeper. This is one that slips by people because it's hard to see. Yeah. So definitely, if you can find it, check out Light of Day. Really cool movie. Yo, you got a real toot, little brother. You got to start your own band. Call it The Attitudes. I've got a, a fun little noir melodrama thriller for everybody. Let's do it. Female on the beach. Nineteen fifty-five director Joseph Pevney. He did a couple other things that I've seen, but nothing that I put a note in about. But this is a Joan Crawford vehicle, and this is kind of during the time when she was like, "You guys need to find me movies, please." She's like forty-nine in this. She's the authenticity of what how she acts in this movie is is, is fantastic. She's a wealthy middle-aged woman. She's a widow, so her husband died, and they have this estate that they had been renting out to people. And she's come back to town to take it back over and kind of fix it up or have it be fixed up for her so that she can then sell it. Mrs. Crandall, your tenant, the lady who had this house, I leased it to her for your husband's estate. I hope Mrs. Crandall was a good tenant. Oh, yes. A quiet little old lady. But when she gets there, she comes to find out through bits and pieces from people around town that the last tenant, who was a similarly aged and wealthy woman, had fallen to her death off of the balcony after drinking a bit too much. What, Mrs. Crandall? All I know is that she left last night. Yeah, she left this way. A swan dive off the top of a brandy bottle. But there's more, obviously. She meets a cast of characters, but all she really wants to do is be left alone. I'd like to be left alone. 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 How do you like your coffee? Alone. I guess you'd like to be left alone, hmm? Everyone somehow has a key to her place, and they keep showing up, and she's like, who, who are you guys? Now, do you mind if I have that key back? I would really like to be left alone, and she gets really like icy, cold, and bitchy, and it's it's really great. Mr. Hall, the key. I mean, she's so much fun when she is mean like that. And she meets the Lothario neighbor, who's called Drummy. Is his name, his nickname? I think it's like Drummond or something. Oh no, that belongs to Drummy. Who? <laughs> Drummond Hall, one of the neighbors. Some name that no one has anymore. Drummy. Played by a guy named Jeff Chandler. The great Jeff Chandler. Is he? Yeah. All right. I didn't, I don't think I've seen anything else he was in, except he was in like a Western I'd seen with Jimmy Stewart. Captain of the Titanic. Stop. Like, <laughs> what if you just started saying everyone is a Captain of the Titanic? Um, okay. He lives out of this boat uh, <laughs> in front of Joe Crawford's house, and he begins to try to woo her. We could, uh, we could go for lobsters. I don't like lobsters. I have a long list of dislikes. It's getting longer. And at first she's like, what, what is this fucking guy doing? There's no way he's interested in me, but she loves the attention mm -hmm. and she's just like soaking it up, but she's really mean to him. You're about as friendly as a suction pump. And it's that Joan Crawford, like she's like always dressed to the nines. She's always just like taking whiskey shots too in this movie, which is really great. And then eventually she's kind of succumbs to his charm. It's a very horny movie. <laughs> you can you can tell she just wants to have sex with this younger dude, and she's just like devilishly mean and hard drinking. And she ends up finding the woman who stayed in the house before her diary, like behind a brick in the fireplace. And she comes to find out that the girl who had jumped to her death or fallen to her death was also dating Drummy. And so now it's like, hmm, maybe it wasn't an accident oh, or maybe Drummy. it was, but also she's having feelings for this new guy. Her holier than thou attitude throughout this whole thing is it's rooted in such like an authenticity. If you know anything about Joan Crawford that it's just like, it's just spectacular to watch and it's really mesmerizing to see her powerhouse through it and just be like super bitchy to everybody. And and I, I like highlighting these like kind of underseen, mm -hmm. fun little noir thrillers. This one I think is worth seeking out if you're just kind of looking for something a little different. I think we're being asked to leave. So do I. Would you like us to go? As far as you like, another continent preferably. So last episode I talked about a movie called The Instructor, kind of a DIY martial arts movie. Yes. And I, I teased that I was going to talk about another one that I think is even better oh, yeah. that I've shown to audiences previously. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm sure Rich knows what through. movie I'm going to talk about. It is called 
parole violators. This movie is incredible. I've yeah. heard of this. It is so much fun. Talk about two rental by approval only movies this well, episode. It's gotta be done. VIP. This movie stars a guy, a guy named Sean Donahue. He's the son of a guy named Pat Donahue who made Kill Force. Is it Kill Force? It's something Force or yeah. Kill Something. I don't know. And they, they, they together, he, he was like they were stunt performers and they made some low budget action movies in the in the nineties. This is the definitely the opus. So Sean stars as Miles Long. Who is <laughs> That's the a host? Great name. There's actually a scene in the movie where one of the characters is like Miles Long. Is that your real name or did you make it up? Yeah, it's my real name. What, your mother and father stupid or something? He's the host of a show called The Parole Violators. So send in those videotapes and we'll see you next week on The Parole Violator. He goes out and finds guys who are parole violators and videotapes them doing new crimes. Don't do anything stupid, Joey. Make it easy on yourself. And getting them busted. You're the star of the TV show Parole Violator. Get your own store, get out of here. Anything to say to your audience? It's your show, my friend. Yeah, hi, mom. Dude, that's like, that would be a reality show Secretly. today. Secretly, he does it. He hosts the show as himself but he actually goes out on patrol with a camera, with a mask on, and he calls himself the video cop. Yeah. Control S1, Ooh. video cop struck again. Ooh. That's sick as hell. He doesn't, he doesn't say it's him, so he's always like, I got this footage. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. amazing. There's a rumor going around that you're the so-called video cop. I hope that isn't true. We're all potential video cops. And it ne it's never made clear how he knows that the parole violator in question is going to be at the convenience store <laughs> to do a crime. He just goes out and picks a guy he doesn't like and follows him around until We're he finally fucks that. it up. Yeah, it's, it's fine. He's got a girlfriend, and his girlfriend has a little daughter. They're kind of off and on again. There's a really funny part where they're kind of having an argument, but he's still like, I'm going to come over and, and have dinner. Remember the last time I cooked you dinner? Yeah, the food was cold, but everything else was hot. Nice. It's, Very cool. it's really bad. <laughs> this guy that he got busted, helped get busted, a child molester named Chino just got paroled. Uh-oh. And he is, this guy is absolutely up for no good. He is introduced, being picked up in prison by his buddy who is like, What do you mean, change man? What do you, like guys now or something? No, girls, little girls, you know, little, little girls, girls, you know? Like, he's just completely unabashed, just a fucking pederast with a record, you know? Like, oh, he just is no. into it. He's broadcasting it. It's yeah. very funny. Before too long, you see where this is going. Chino ends up abducting the girlfriend's daughter, and Miles and, the, and his lady friend have to take on all these bad guys and get her back. There's a couple of shotguns in the back seat. Basically, this movie is like 95 minutes of ass kicking. It is like very backyard DIY. We had a couple of gym mats and threw the guy off the roof kind of stuff. <laughs> yes. And it's just constant, like, like roundhouse kicking, jumping off the balcony and falling onto the roof of a car. It's just constant. I'd like to point out that on the cover, he is pointing a pistol straight ahead and has a shotgun behind his back. Yeah, 100%. And he's shirtless. That's how you got to go. If there's, a, if there's a window, somebody's getting thrown through Somebody it. is getting thrown through it. Where'd you come from? Through the window. And there's, and it is also just packed to the gills with dumbass idiot henchmen with memorable dialogue. What's your name? Goon. Goon. That's nice. Like the Goonie bird? Don't you ever associate me with a bird. Birds are weak. All kinds of insane stuff going on in this movie. She's gonna love this. And it has an incredibly well telegraphed and thirst quenching villain send off at the very end. I've Sick. shown this to audiences. It is a revelation. If you get to see this with a with a group of people, you will have an incredible time. If you watch it by yourself, you're gonna have a good time too. But if you're gonna watch Pearl yeah, Violators, like, bring some folks over, I want crack to that a couple right of beers, yeah. engage in the substance of your choice if you need one, and enjoy this this masterpiece. I can't stress enough how 
completely balls stupid it is. <laughs> How exciting watching these guys just throw themselves against walls uh, for 90 minutes is. Also, be warned, it has basically one piece of music that plays throughout the entire <laughs> film. It is the only score. They didn't need to spend more money. it will get stuck in your head because it's extremely monotonous and repetitive. Make sure you see Parole Violators. I, I know that I've, I've been sort of proselytizing about this one for a long time. I talk about it any chance I get, but I felt like it was about time that I, that I featured it on Viva. Come so over to Scarecrow sure and this. rent Parole Violators. Yeah, you will have to put down a $300 deposit Worth to rent every this penny. one. Also, by the way, just fun story, this particular copy used to belong to our good friend Brian Sauer, who, who oh, really? sold it to me and I donated it to the store. Well, there we go. Thanks, Thanks once Brian. again, Brian. Let's see if I got this straight. Every 30 seconds we fight, you poke a hole in the raft. Maybe you don't realize when you poke a hole in the raft, the air's gonna leak out. And the little girl will sink. What's our dog movie this week? It's, man, it's about a lot of dogs. It's not just one dog. It's not just two dogs. It's 101 it's of 101 them. 101 Dalmatians. The 1990 what? What year? 96, 96 which is crazy to remake. me yeah. that this was 1996 because it, I don't know, I always thought it was like, oh, it was like 2000s or something. It was 96. Yeah. Starring Jeff Daniels and Jolie Richardson and of course, Glenn Close as Cruella DeVille. Those horrible noisy things that children play with on their televisions, someone designs them. What a senseless thing to do with your life. Oh my gosh, in, in like a, just an earth shattering role. Well, if we make this coat, it would be as if I were wearing your dog. <laughs> woof, woof. <laughs> She's pretty much the only reason to watch this She's one. so good in this. Get down from there and catch those puppies! So this is directed by Stephen Herrick, who did Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, mm -hmm. among others. A screenplay by John Hughes. Yeah. You guys probably know the story, but in case you don't, it takes place in London. We're introduced to Roger. <laughs> and he's played by Jeff Daniels, who's delightful and gets to do a lot of slapsticky stuff in this, which I love. He is a video game designer who's trying to design a, a fun game that'll make him rich, but it's about Dalmatians. Because mm -hmm. he has a Dalmatian. Because he has a Dalmatian. Pongo. Pongo. The feedback he's getting from this one kid who's apparently judging all the video games in all of London this is that- This little kid sucks. He's got the best instincts in the industry. Is that? What do you think? Potentially good graphics, reasonably entertaining premise, the dog's well conceived and the environments are engaging. But I'm not interested in a game that has a chubby little dog catcher as the bad guy. You need a, a villain that you just want to annihilate. And he's like, oh. And then we also have Jolie Richardson, who's Anita, who's a designer, a fashion designer. She like draws for the House of Deville. Mm -hmm. Anita, darling. <sighs> Which is where Cruella, works, is, just lives, just has. She just is. She just is. She's a high fashion house lady and she loves fur. I live for fur. I worship fur. After all, is there a woman in all this wretched world who doesn't? But the fur on a Dalmatian is too coarse, so she has to get puppies. I'm afraid it is a little coarse. Pity. But it was very fine when she was a puppy. Redemption. So when Roger and Anita meet, they fall in love, they meet at this park and all these shenanigans She's happen. got a Dalmatian too, right? Yeah, she's got a Dalmatian named Perdita, mm -hmm. Purdy. They fall in love, it's really cute because she's like way more into him at first than he is. Jolly nice human, don't you think? <laughs> and they like basically talk about marriage on like night one, mm -hmm. but it ends up working out and then she gets pregnant. Is this true? Yes. Oh, you poor thing. I'm so sorry. Their dogs fall in love. There's a whole wedding ceremony where all the dogs are also outside. There's like all, the dogs from all the town are outside because it's also the marriage ceremony of uh, Perdita and Pongo. They're getting married because dogs get married. P Perdita also finds out she's pregnant. Cruella Deville is sad. How could she do this to me? That Anita is going to be leaving because she's like, a, you're a great designer or whatever. And also she says, More good women have been lost to marriage into war, famine, disease, and disaster. Which I thought was really funny. Anita being the literally only person in this movie that Cruella is nice to. Yeah, and she's like, 
bare. She's Barely like just nice. not mean to her. Also, I'm gonna kidnap all your dogs. Yeah, and she's so unhinged, and like everything she's saying is just like, Ugh. but she's just like. Be sure to let me know when the blessed event occurs. Oh, well, it won't be for another eight months. The puppies, darling. <laughs> I have no use for babies. She has her two henchmen, one played by Hugh Laurie and the other's this other, other guy. guy. Dr. House and his friend. Yeah, they're like camped out outside the house to tell Cruella when these puppies are born. Right. So as soon as they're born, like literally day after, Cruella like bursts in and is like, oh my God, where are they? She sees them, they don't have their spots yet. No spots at all. What horrible little white rats! Because they're just born they're just and babies. she's like, oh, they're so ugly. But when they get their spots, let me know. I'll take them, we'll throw them in the sack. The puppies are not for sale. You are quite sure. Yes. yes. You fools! You idiots! They There's... kidnap the dogs, and then the dogs go on an adventure where they're escaping from Cruella because they're in their big mansion. Yeah, and Cruella's hired this this guy named Skinner. Furious Ominously named. Black market taxidermist fur trader. Pongo and Perdita only have 15 puppies. They don't have 101 Dalmatians. That would be crazy. But they have acquired, Cruella through devious means has acquired these other Dalmatians to equal out to 101. So basically Skinner is gonna come in and murder all of them one by one. I don't know, I don't think they thought that, that through. Any way you want. Poison them, drown them, bash them on the head. Got any chloroform? I don't care how you kill the little beast, just do it and do it now! They send out a signal, and so all the other dogs in the town. There's that sheep dog. Yeah, the sheep. It, it's the sheep dog, and then there's like that, like kind of poodle schnauzery dog, who is actually the real hero of the whole thing. Basically, yes. Really, it goes through, and they they send the signal out to even the forest creatures, mm -hmm. so that they can save the Dalmatians. And a lot of the stuff. So it was 1996. So there's very early CGI here, but there's also a lot of puppets that were actually. Yeah, at the puppets the are cool. They're from the Jim Henson. Yeah. Whatever. You know. His, his puppet factory. I don't know what you call it. I did look up because I was like, how many puppies can dogs have? So this is just a little fun break fact. So the average amount of puppies a dog can have is around five to six. Usually they're smaller, just one or two. But the biggest litter ever recorded was in 2004 from a Mastiff. And she had 24 puppies. That is too many Mastiffs. And those guys are going to get... Big. Can you imagine if you had to feed all those 24 dogs? 24 Mastiffs? Jesus Christ. 24 Mastiffs. It's also very cute. At one point, the puppies are all watching the animated movie Aristocats, the Disney movie, and then they're like, huh? And then they change it to Homeward Bound. And it's the scene, I think it's the scene where Shadow is reunited. Because you, you hear Shadow's voice That's for a right. second. And they can do that because it's Disney. So all the like farm animals, the raccoons, the squirrels, they I all- I love the raccoons. Oh my gosh. And, they all decide to go break these dogs out of this like weird mansion prison where they're held, mm -hmm. being watched over by the the two fumbling dog napper guys. And they literally like home alone booby trap this yep. entire place. Come here, you speckled lap rat. <laughs> The raccoons with their little hands are like hot wiring cars. It's literally home alone. It's like step on a plank and like a fucking paint can and shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you didn't like this as much as I did upon rewatch. I did rewatch, not like it though. But the antics. Yeah. You're kidding me? And the puppies were so cute. But there is some really funny, terrible CGI. My favorite uh, kind of janky special effect was at the end when they all nod, and they all nod oh, in this very, very yeah, like, that rigid is, that in unison. Oh, yeah, that is really weird. That, and when they go down the slide, and they're, like, sliding back and forth, and they're like, whoa. There's a couple funny parts. The the two dog nappers, they slip off some logs and, like, electrocute their, their balls at one point, which is pretty funny. All right, now, when I count to three, we jump. Ready? Yes. One. No, you don't want to do that. And then Cruella gets involved because, you know, she has to do it herself because these guys aren't getting anything done. Dummies. I'm reduced to tramping through sewage because my two imbeciles can't keep track of a bunch of infant dogs. But she goes, she falls in a pit of molasses. Oh, all that muck. It, it's really scary looking. It's, she, it's just like crusted all over her. They eventually all get arrested. Yeah. When the puppies go home. 
and she reaches into her purse, but her purse is actually a skunk. That was pretty funny too. That was good. <laughs> it ends with them adopting all 101 of these Dalmatians, which is they moved extremely to a palatial insane. estate, and they literally move to like Dalmatian Island. Yeah. It's like they they pull out, and it's just thousands and thousands of Dalmatians. This movie used over 300 puppies. Mm for just the main puppies because they had they to shoot them. them. They had to use, use, shoot them at five weeks old. And so they had to keep getting new getting puppies new that puppies. were five weeks old. I think in order to do that, the production, whoever was head of production had to guarantee whoever he was getting the puppies from that they were guaranteed adoption. So apparently mm. all the puppies in this were adopted Good. because of this like movie. To hear that. Love to hear that. This was a fun one. Uh, definitely the best part was Cruella. She's good. My main my main problem with this movie was that the dogs don't talk. Yeah, you and they talk the in the cartoon. Yeah. I feel like there's way more human antics in this movie than there is dog antics. That's true. And that the dogs have a lot less personality. You, first of all, you kind of get to know fewer of them. Yeah, they don't. They're not really. There's Remember that one dog? <laughs> Wizard. Is he pees on stuff? Yeah. Um, that's cute. I mean, that's all good, but I feel like there's a lot less of it. And, and It's not dog forward. It's not as dog forward. It's also like 20 minutes longer than the cartoon. That's true. And I'm a big fan of that cartoon movie because it, it was made weird. They, they made it with Xerox oh. uh, because they were trying to cut costs and like, whether you believe me or not, it looks like there's toner dust all over the frames. Like it has this really like dusty texture to it. Yeah, it looks really weird, cool. Yeah. And, uh, and Cruella is, I mean, Glenn Close is great in this movie, not taken away from her, but yeah. Cruella as an animated creation is really, really something else. Yeah. Have you ever read the book? I don't know. I mean, I've read like the Disney picture book when I was little, right, but I right. don't know how much of the book no, it the, was. No, the, the novel that it, this is based on. I the, should the, not read the novel, It's though. very weird. The guy, the guy who wrote it was like a real conservative British guy. And in is this the, a metaphor? Is 101 Dalmatians a metaphor? Yeah, for, like, yeah. No, it totally is. In Like in the book, the guy, the main capital. character isn't a musician. He's an economist. And he gets to live tax-free because he solved Britain's economy. Huh. It's very weird. And, and so the movie, because he lives tax-free, he decides to adopt, adopt 101 Dalmatians. In, yeah, in That's the, what and, I do. And in the, in the original cartoon movie, there are all these weird hints about British society being crazy. Like when the dogs are escaping from the mansion, the two, the two dog nappers are watching this weird game show where convicted felons can get their sentences commuted if they answer trivia questions. Weird. It's very uh, strange. The movie's very weird. So well, I kind of missed that vibe. Yeah, yeah. But as a kid's movie made for kids in the 90s with these special effects, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Maybe eventually we will watch the Yeah, the I, I rewatched sure. it just to compare with oh, this. Yeah? So like it's pretty fresh in my head. Oh, nice. But yeah, it, it's really good. Yeah. 101 Dalmatians. How many paws are you going to give this one? I feel like I enjoyed it two and a half paws, but objectively, if you want, if you, especially if you have kids who like dogs, like this is a three paw movie. Yeah. I'm going to give this a three, almost a three and a half paw movie. I really had fun watching this. Sometimes when we put these dog movies on, I'm just like, all right, let's get through this dog movie yeah. because you know, you guys know a lot of them are stinkers, well, but this one was we like, get really excited about them and then they turn out to know, not and then it good. breaks our heart. Like but this Diggy. one I kind of knew cause I remember liking it when I was little. Yeah. So yeah. Also her fashion, Glenn Close fashion in this, the gloves with the nails on it. Oh my gosh. Should we do the sequel at some point? 102? Yeah, we should do that at some point. Not yeah. next though. Next. We have so many, but next we have a request from my little sister who oh, okay. watched this movie when she was very little, littler than she is now. And this is Underdog, which is something that I don't even remember hearing about. Have you ever watched the old cartoon that this is based on? No. Oh, I don't boy. even know anything. I, all I know, there's a dog and he's a superhero. Yep. And I think this is from 2007. John Slattery's in it. Oh, I just watched his episode of Sex and the City Amy today. Adams. <laughs> oh, he's P-Man. Yeah, he is. Yeah. <laughs> this will be fun. Yeah, Saving maybe. Saving the world one paw at a time. One paw at a time. Uh, my sister also sent me a red carpet photo of a couple of the dogs on red carpet, which is always cute. I love that. Yeah. I'm into that. So yeah, Underdog is next up on the dog movie agenda. Dipstick. Uh. What a quick bite. That was a tasty what quick a bite, tasty though. tasty treat. A morsel. What a delicious morsel this episode 80 has been. If you want longer episodes, we can help you with that, but you need to send us some mail. 
You need to give us those rapid recs donations. Oh yeah, for sure. But even if that doesn't happen, we're still gonna yeah. come back with the goods. Go back to the episode before this one and vote for Ranch versus Rom because I think probably next time we'll have a winner we'll have for a you and a new one. Music um, for another in another room versus Hometown USA. Hometown USA, right, right. <laughs> two obscure yeah, ones. Two I think right now they're pretty even voting wise, so go go make some waves. I have maybe a new guest for an episode soon, too, that we'll talk about later. Oh, yeah? And, yeah, fun things on the horizon. And in order to keep this going and keep everything fun, please donate to Scarecrow Video. And uh, check out all the links below. Follow us on all of the social medias. There we go. You did it. Been waiting for that. <laughs> Follow us on all the social medias. Like this. Subscribe. Comment below. And email us viva at scarecrow.com. And, I mean... Viva Keep on rocking and rolling and making good movies. Keep on rocking in the free world, right? <sighs>